Bitch. It's time that you motherfuckers learn from the best. This has been around for a very long, long time. It's just that right now it is absolutely exploding. Diabolical narcissism is the overarching dynamic driving evil in the world. It's absolutely essential that you get that word diabolical in there so that you have a, a term within the term that specifically references the supernatural, okay? Just what the motherfucking doctor ordered. Welcome back to Badass Conjure TV. I am the Oracle slash Badass Witch, Oshun Ajay. Today, we're going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to actually retell my dream about the time of change okay because i reference it a lot in the videos that i do about narcissism and so um even though this this um this um dream uh the, the telling of it does exist on my uh house of ajay channel uh so if anybody wants to go and and reference back um to back when i actually recorded it and um if anybody remembers i actually had recorded this dream um at least a year and a half to two years ago on my original channel um, badass witches TV. So this dream has been told before and, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and retell it so that, um, as I reference the dream going forward, um, you guys will, uh, you know, have something to reference back to, to know what I'm talking about as far as this narc empath war, um, is concerned. Okay. So I also feel the need to clarify, uh, concerning the, um, you know, sweet mom for life, Tasha K, um, empath narc war that I used to illustrate my teaching. Um, let me clarify my position on that because, you know, I know it appears that I was partial and biased, um, and basically leaning more towards sweet my side. And um, I'm not going to deny that that was the case, but it, let me also clarify that it was never personal. It was never personal against Tasha K. It was never personal towards Sweet Ma for Life. I don't know either one of them. Okay. My stance is that I'm always going to be on the side of the impasse. Okay. And the reason I'm going to retell my dream is so that you guys understand where I'm coming from and that I'm not up nobody's ass. Okay. Like people seem to want to think I'm up Sweet Ma's ass. Um, and I'm not, um, you know, basically uh, targeting. I'm not targeting um, Tasha K. Okay. And those of you who have been following me um, for any amount of time, you know that I am engaged in my own personal um, online battle with my own um, obsessed um, narcissist. Okay. So to give the people who are new to the situation and new to my channel, um, a better frame of reference of why I am involved in the whole situation, um, just check it out. This is the brutal truth. You cannot have an intelligent discussion of any of these dynamics unless you acknowledge the supernatural, unless you discuss these concepts vis-a-vis -vis the supernatural. They say when you play with fire, you get burned. So my dream began with um, the person that I was in a relationship at the time and um, I uh, were sitting uh, next to one another on the couch in the apartment that I lived in um, with him at the time, okay? And above our heads uh, were floating two um, huge butterflies, okay? Uh, the butterflies were 
um, do two different types of butterflies, basically indicating to me that um, we were two different breeds of people and that the relationship probably wouldn't last. Okay, because that was one of the questions that was on my heart at the time when I had the dream. Okay, so not only were the butterflies um, above our heads, uh, the one above my head was a monarch butterfly, which if you'll um, research um, the uh, MK Ultra Mo Monarch Mind Control, um, you know, um, situation, um, there'll be a lot that actually unfolded for me going forward um, after um, I learned, because I learned about the monarch butterflies and all that afterwards. But anyway, um, because this dream was over 20 years ago, by the way, you know, it's probably at, at least 15, 20 years ago. I'm thinking about 20 years ago because my daughter was not um, five years old yet. Okay. So, but anyway, um, so what happened? Okay. So the butterflies were over our heads. I had a monarch over my head and it was, it was larger than the average butterfly. Okay. The butterfly that was over his head was a huge, um, silky velvety, um, uh, jet black, uh, black butterfly that had a, a rim around it that was hot pink, very unusual looking, and it moved very beautiful and gracefully, and it was it was very beautiful. Um, so basically, uh, but that's not the point. The point was that those butterflies were there, um, and the message for me, you know, about them being two different ones was again that you know that was that not the relationship, and I'm not in that relationship right now. Um, but also there were butterflies of different sizes um, all over the house, all throughout um, the apartment. Okay, all the way. From from the front to the back. So it, you know, I got the overall message that it was the time of change, which is why I call this uh, dream because it was a prophetic dream, the time of change. Okay. The next scene from that was that um, I was at my, my job. Okay. And in real life, I have been um, an executive assistant to a lot of um, different um, businessmen, quote unquote, businessmen. Okay. So I was at work. Um, it was a, a typical office setting. Uh, people had their desks. Uh, some people had cubicles, and um, the boss um, has he had a de he had a he had his own office um, that you know basically had windows that you can see through, but you basically couldn't hear anything if you were you know in his office. And he had a full uh, view of the office. Okay, and um, of course I had um, a desk that was that near his office. Okay. So so one by one, he was calling in um, the um, the employees, okay? And before I go forward, um, I wanted to make a note that um, it wasn't a specific person who was the boss, um, but it basically was telling us about a specific type of person, okay? So the boss was the typical, you know, um, white guy, you know, um, middle-aged, uh, you know, older white guy um, wearing a um, dark suit, okay? Because in the first dream, uh, when I was telling the first dream, I, I did, I meant, I said that they would be wearing a, a black or a brown suit, and actually, I didn't mean to say brown, I meant to say blue, okay? So they were, you know, the typical, um, like I said, middle-aged white guy wearing a black or brown suit, okay? White shirt and a dark tie. Um, so, you know, he was calling the people in one by one and um, supposedly briefing them on something that, um, you know, was regarding the company that we worked for. Okay. So me being, you know, curious as I am, I um, was wondering why, um, if, if this was a briefing about the company, why was he calling people in one by one and not, um, you know, just briefing everyone um, in one big meeting. Okay. So I began to be curious and I began to listen um, to what was being said in the meetings. So um, one by one, he would call them in and he would leave uh, the door open, um, you know, and again, my desk was very close to the door. So I just tuned in and I started, I noticed that he was, he was saying um, things about the company, but in between those words, um, there were other words being spoken, words that were in Latin that I at the time did not know the meaning of. Also, there was um, a second voice that um, manifested as a, a devilish undertone. Um, 
in his voice. Okay. So that, you know, how you, you know, you've heard it on movies when a person is possessed, you hear that second, um, demonic voice. Okay. So I heard that, um, in his voice. And then when the people after getting the briefing, because what was happening was that they didn't hear those extra words that he was slipping in. They were like subliminal. Um, for some reason I could hear them. Okay. But they didn't, they only heard the words that he was saying that were regarding the company. So when they came out of the office, they all also had that demonic undertone in their voices and um, they didn't know it. So basically what was happening was these people were going into his office one by one being possessed and they didn't even know it. So they would come out and they were possessed and didn't even know it. Okay, so moving forward, and I'm going to come back to where I am. Well, let me go finish with the dream. Okay, so they were well, they were possessed. Okay, so I noticed that what was happening, and I was like, oh, hell no. Nah. You know what I'm saying? I am not going in here because I see what's happening. I got to find a way to get the hell up out of here, um, and that was my goal. Okay, so I'm looking for a way to get up out of here. And um, let me mention that there was a security guard that stood by the door of the office, okay? And uh, the security guard was not human, okay? Because he, he did not speak words. He made grunts, okay? Like, mm. and when he would make those grunts, you did... Um, it, he was communicating what he wanted to say. You did understand what he was meaning, but he didn't speak, okay? And he was not completely human. For some reason, in the dream, this was normal, Okay. So I go to the boss who trusted me um, and I told him, you know, look, I got something in my car. Well, well, first of all, let me back up. I noticed that the reason I mentioned the security guard was because be, when I first noticed the people coming out and they were possessed, I decided that I was going to leave. So I tried to get up and just walk out, which I had always been free to do. Um, and this is when the security guard made this grunting noise and a gesture like, mm you know, trying, telling me basically you can't leave. Right. So I'm like, oh, you got me you messed up. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, I'm not one of these people and you're not keeping me up in here. You know what I'm saying? So I knew that I had to be cunning. So I go to the boss. I, like I said, he trusted me. I said, look, this motherfucker is trying to not let me out of the door. Um, you know, I need to go get some shit out of my car. What's going on? You know? So I basically, I was pretending not to know anything about what was going on. And, um, you know, like I didn't know nothing. And I was just, it was a regular day and I was trying to go get some something out of my car. However, the security guard, again, who was not human, he knew that I had figured it out. Okay. But the boss, um, who was the one who was possessing the people, he did not know. Okay. So the boss told the security guard to let me, let me out the damn door and leave me alone. Right. So I was like, yeah, motherfucker move, you know? So he moves out of the way. He lets me out the door, but he didn't trust me. So he's still looking at me and kind of following behind me a little bit, you know? And so I'm like, damn, this motherfucker's following me and shit. So if I go to my car and get in it's going to cause this big ruckus you know what i'm saying or he's going to try to stop me i'm gonna have to fight this big motherfucker or whatever so i when i went out the door he was kind of following behind me but at a little distance and he was walking kind of you know he wasn't really right behind me you know what i'm saying just kind of making sure i go to my car so when i get outside the door this girl pulls up okay in a station wagon it was a white girl um, blonde white girl. Um, she pulls up. I, she, I get in the station wagon because she has a car full of other, like a few other employees in the building who had figured it out. And they was like, get in, get in, get in. So instead of trying to fight him to get in my own car, I just jumped in the car with them. Cause I didn't give a damn. I was just trying to get away. Okay. So when I, I go, I'd get in the car with them. So the girl, it's a long ass station wagon. Uh, I remember there was other people in the car. Uh, there was one other black person, which was a black man who, whose leg was broken. Okay. And that stood out because we had to keep the back of the station wagon open. You know how they have that little door that flips down. Well, we had to open that. And I remember him sitting in the very back of it. There was a couple of other people back there with him, but his leg um, had to stick out of that door because he had a cast on his leg and his leg was broken, which is very indicative of um, a black man um, in this war being um, partially crippled. Okay. So anyway, there was other white people in the car. Um, I remember the girl, there was another girl, white girl. There was me. I think everybody else was white men. And then um, when we got to her house, which was out in the country, this is where she drove us to, um, a, you know, a, a small little, you know, modest little house out in the country. And 
we get there and we're all discussing um, what, you know, what had happened and what we had, we had seen. Okay. And so I'm telling them about what I noticed and what made me run out of the, of the door, you know, of the place. And, um, they, she had two little brothers that were there. Okay. And I'm going to come back to the two little brothers because they're very significant in the story. Um, because they were children. Okay. They looked to be maybe between the ages of seven and nine years old. Okay. And, um, I was telling everyone while I'm telling them about what I seen, I told them about the words that I heard in Latin and they, the little boys, because they, they read these, these like, um, comic books that were based on the occult and, and things of that nature. Um, they knew what the words meant. Okay. And, um, they, was started saying the words okay and as they were saying the words this demonic undertone in their voices began to rise up in them okay so the same way that i would see it appear in the other people um at work okay and so i um just you know naturally because they were children i just grabbed them and shook it out of them and told them don't say that don't say that and so as i as i would shake it you know was shaking them i saw that spirit um like you know go away from them okay fly up out of them basically and so after I, you know, right after I shook that spirit out of them, we heard like a racket at the doors and windows, right? So we look up and this was like a scene in a movie, I swear. Um, we look up and we look at the windows, we look at the doors and everywhere and all we see are faces. Like there was no clear spot on the doors or the windows. Every single spot um, on the door or the window or any spot that you could see through was covered with the face of a demonic person. Like, you know, so basically what it represented and what it was symbolizing was that the whole world was possessed. Okay. And they didn't even know it, but they were after us um, who were, like I said, five adults and two little boys okay that were in the house who had not yet been possessed and they were trying to get to us okay so what I knew was in my heart was that um, we had to fight these people okay so this war was going to come um, we knew in our hearts that we had were already promised the victory of this war we were not afraid of these people we just were taking in the sheer volume of people that we were going to have to fight we knew that we were going to win because somehow the knowing was put into our hearts we knew that we were going to have to fight um, but we had to fight like the whole world so it basically represented five percent of the world who were empathic in nature okay and two children and um, and then um, the whole rest of the world being 95% of the world being um, narcissistic in nature, okay? And so, um, again, knowing we were going to win the fight, um, that did not um, take away the fact that we had to fight, meaning that we may lose something. Uh, you could lose a limb. Um, you could lose an eye. Um, you can lose some of your faculties. Um, you might get hurt. You will get hurt. Um, you are going to take some blows. You're going to take some L's but at the end of the day um, the victory is yours okay so that was how the dream ended with us looking up evaluating um, the fact that we were surrounded um, in this little house okay and the house always represents uh, your soul yourself within yourself um, surrounded by um, these demonically possessed people and knowing um, going in that we were going to win the fight um, and that we had to fight now that's how that dream ended. Um, but there was um, a part two to that dream. Okay. Um, and that one was called the great fire. And I will put the link to my house of Ajay channel um, under this video so that if you are interested in seeing the original uh, recording, which was not very good, but it's there. Um, you can see that and also you can continue because there are um, other parts to the dream okay that do link up with um, occurrences and things that have been happening um, in our society okay so so basically I just wanted to tell that part of the dream so that you understand what I'm talking about when I relate it to um, you know things like Tasha K my own personal stalker um, what's happening in the government with our very narcissistic um, president and um you know things that may be happening in your own personal lives going forward okay put you on the armor of god that you may be able to stand against the deceits of the devil so you've got 
the supernatural Satan and the demons in the background driving all of this and encouraging all of this in human beings who then take on the traits of demons and then go out and attack other human beings as mercenaries. <laughs> well, guess what? I'm here to let you fucking have it. She gotta go, she gotta go. Diabolical narcissists are constantly envious of others and they seek to hurt or destroy the objects of their frustration. She gotta motherfucking go. If they, have, if they have become fixated on you and you're a target. Basic ass witches. You have to stay away. <laughs> eeny, meeny, teeny, weeny. They will never stop. Looking like a polka dog bikini. Narcissists are not obsessed with their true selves, which they hate, okay? They loathe themselves, their true selves. They are instead obsessed with a false self, a false reflection, which is their own creation. So I hope you guys understand a little better now um, why I have no choice but to fight um, this war. I am being attacked um, by my own demon. So it's not about Tasha K or uh, Sweet Ma for Life, but it's about a spiritual war. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the shadiest bitch witch wannabe of them all? You have to face it for the good of your own soul. We're not gonna let them go. Nope. Uh-uh. Nope. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Not this life. Ooh. It's the supernatural behind all of that. Um, you can go on and on and on. Pull your focus back and truly see the big picture, the supernatural picture in all this. People freely choosing to adopt the demonic psycho-spiritual posture and emotional palette and thus becoming hell's mercenaries are everywhere on earth across every culture. Just like in my dream. They're much more subtle, much more serpentine in their attack and they're going after people's souls. Iron rod and powder stones. Iron rods and powder stones. Iron rods and power stones. <laughs> Diabolical narcissists are almost completely devoid of empathy. They are devoid of empathy. Mm. Sound like some bones breaking up, if you ask me. Mm unable or unwilling to identify with, acknowledge, or accept the feelings, needs, preferences, priorities, and choices of others. We're not gonna let them go. Nope. It's like tweed, the fabric tweed. If you look at tweed fabric, it's a weave of very, very dark threads and very, very light threads. So that's like the diabolical narcissist soul. And what has to happen is all of the dark threads have to be pulled out of the weave, which is the person, which is their soul, leaving only the light threads. That's gonna take a long time. That's a very, very intensive act of purgation, burning this out of somebody's soul because it completely pervades their soul. Beat their fucking asses. Narcissists are masters of projection and gaslighting. Now let's talk about what projection is. Projection is accusing others of having the character flaws and or committing the crimes that the diabolical narcissist are themselves committing. You tried playing these games for so long, honey. Oh, 
It's getting quite tiring. Does this sound familiar? Have you watched a political press conference lately? Have you noticed that all these politicians do is accuse other people of doing exactly the things that they're doing? That is projection. This is a key trait and tactic of diabolical narcissists. Gaslighting. This is, I'm just quoting Wikipedia here because this is a very good and succinct description of what gaslighting is. Gaslighting is a form of mental abuse in which information is twisted or spun, selectively omitted to favor the abuser, or false information is presented with the intent of making victims doubt their own memory, perception, and sanity. Instances may range simply from the denial by an abuser that previous abusive incidents ever occurred, all the way up to the staging of bizarre events by the abuser with the intention of disorienting the victim. <laughs> you tried playing these games for so long, honey. Oh, it's getting quite tiring. Gaslighting by totalitarian governments. Okay, we are going to be taking several citations from the 45 declared goals of the communist takeover of America, which was read into the congressional record on January 10th, 1963. These are items 38 and 39 from the 45 declared goals of, of communism. Number 38 transfer some of the powers of arrest from the police to social agencies, treat all behavioral problems as psychiatric disorders which no one but psychiatrists can understand or treat. That's objective number 38. Objective number 39, dominate the psychiatric profession and use mental health laws as a means of gaining coercive control over those who oppose communist goals. This is going on right now as we speak in the United States of America. That um, the FBI information, if somebody suspects, if someone accuses someone of being crazy or mentally ill, that that information could be passed to the government and used in and of itself to you know, deprive people of the right to own firearms. And it's going to get to the point where people are going to be, as they were in the Soviet Union, people are going to be declared mentally unfit or insane simply for not conforming to the agenda of Washington, D.C. We're not doing credit. You're going to give me my fucking money back. Excuse me, sir. There's a young man in here. And you want to call Excuse me. It's ma'am. It is ma'am. I can call the police if you'd like me to. You need to settle down. You need to settle down. If you call Bruce Jenner a man, you are crazy. You are mentally unstable. Mind your business, okay? Ma'am, once again, ma'am. I said both of you. No, you said sir. Once again, it's ma'am. I actually said both of you guys. It was a general. Right beforehand, you fucking said sir. Sir? Okay. Motherfucker, take it outside. If you want to call me sir again, I will show you a fucking sir. I apologize. If you call Bruce Jenner a man, you are crazy. You are mentally unstable. Motherfucker! I apologize now. You must be put away for the protection of society. This is a form of gaslighting. I need your corporate number because I'm going to talk, call them and talk about how it's misgendered several times in this store. I apologize for that. I need your corporate number now. Now, it's interesting, when diabolical narcissists run up against a person of sufficiently strong character that is keenly attuned to reality and is thus not susceptible to accusations of insanity, the diabolical narcissist then drops into a second and final form of gaslighting, accusing the victim of being a bad person. Public character assassination may then follow. Which I plan on telling the entire LGBTQ community, you're going to lose money over this. Ow. Get it for me now. I'm going to ask you to calm down and stop cussing. Give me your corporate number. Well, I'm going to ask you for the fifth time to stop calling me a man, because quite clearly I am not. You must be put away for the protection of society. 
This is a form of gaslighting. I'm sorry for that, ma'am. I will get to that number. Is that okay? Purposeful. Yes, I'm get it for me now. I'm asking you to stop Get it for me now. I'm sorry. You must be put away for the protection of society. This is a form of gaslighting. I'm not cussing. Give me the damn number. Please. You must be put away for the protection of society. This is a form of gaslighting. I will get to that number right now. This description of diabolical narcissism is merely skeletal. In order to flesh out the corpus, one key concept must be added, which psychology lacks. Here we go. Here we go into punchline number one. We have to integrate the supernatural into this. You are going to disqualify the supernatural in all this. You, you have no hope. Because an excuse by definition is a dispensation from moral culpability. Modern psychology is completely concerned with generating an excuse for every single act of evil in the world. That's what it is. That's why it's so monstrously flawed. Diabolical narcissists are human beings that have by their own free will chosen to purge themselves of all love, and another word for love is charity, which is used very often in scripture, and thus all positive emotions derived from love. When a human being, for whatever reason, decides, I am not going to love, and they begin this process, and it can happen very quickly, of purging all love out of their heart. In purging themselves of all charity, they become incapable of love. Because they are incapable of love, the only emotions that they feel with depth are the big four. Anger, hatred, jealousy or envy, and fear. This is what I will refer to for the rest of the lecture as the demonic emotional palette. This is exactly what demons are. That's what diabolical narcissists are. What this, this means is these human beings have freely chosen to adopt the psycho-spiritual posture and emotional palette of demons. It's an extremely important concept. The reason why is spite, pure spite. Diabolical narcissists are direct analogs to demons. Let me say it again. Diabolical narcissists are direct analogs to demons and should be thought of as mercenaries of hell looking to crush and even kill the souls of other human beings out of pure spite. Diabolical narcissists are consumed with envy of people who are capable of love and normal human affection. How sad is that? They see people who are loving, who are manifesting love, and it enrages them. Of you motherfuckers want a surprise from Big Mama. Diabolical narcissists are consumed with fear that the reality of their true selves, which they loathe, and their false selves, which they are desperate to maintain, will be exposed. This, this phenomenon is global. It's worldwide. It's everywhere. Satan doesn't care. All he cares about is getting as many people to hell as he can. The more you purge love out of your soul and the more your mind is completely operating on anger, hatred, jealousy, and fear, the more sexually perverted you become. Fastest way to create a diabolical narcissist. Get them as a kid and sexually abuse them. They will shut down. They will purge all love from their souls, even as prepubescent children, and that'll be the end of it. Remember, diabolical narcissism is when a human being freely chooses to purge all love from their soul. Diabolical narcissists are incapable of love. They are only capable of the demonic emotional palette of anger, hatred, jealousy, and fear. Diabolical narcissists are not only unqualified, but extremely dangerous to souls. 
You can pick which one of you motherfuckers want a surprise from Big Mama. Their condition is connected to the demonic realm. We're definitely not gonna let them go. No, we're not. Their condition is connected to the demonic Their realm. Eyes out. <laughs> okay, so we clearly need a wider focus here. Why must there be a war, you ask? Let's listen to Vaknin, who's a self-proclaimed diabolical narcissist. According to Vaknin, going back to him, extreme trauma can sometimes break, quote unquote, a diabolical narcissist. He claims that's what happened to him. He says he's still a diabolical narcissist and a psychopath, but that he became more self-aware when he was arrested and put in prison. Given how widespread diabolical narcissism is now in today's culture, it's terrifying to think of how extreme a trauma will be needed to reform an entire civilization. Because that's what we're talking about here. Something is going to have to happen that is so bad and so traumatic that even the diabolical narcissists are, are shaken by it. That, this is a terrifying thing to think about because this implies just catastrophic war and likely civilizational collapse. Rampant worldwide diabolical narcissism was foretold by our Lord in the Gospels. Matthew 24, 12, and because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. What does that mean? The charity of many will grow cold. People will be incapable of love. They will purge all love out of their hearts. And Luke 18, 8, the son of man, when he cometh, shall he find, thank you, faith on earth. Mass apostasy, which implies mass diabolical narcissism. Those who know about and understand diabolical narcissism and can recognize it when it enters their life and even attacks them personally have, a f have far better odds of surviving it and not becoming diabolical narcissists themselves. The key is discrediting diabolical narcissists. That's the key to everything and that is why I, have, I am making this video. This is the entire motivation. If you know what this is, and it comes after you, you can look at a diabolical narcissist and say, exactly as you would look at a demon who manifested in front of you and started hissing at you how much it hated you. You would just look at it and say, I, I know what you are and you can't hurt me. I know what you are and you can't hurt me. Not anymore. If you, after watching this, have just realized, oh my gosh, someone I love is probably a diabolical narcissist. And you're sitting there feeling intense, intense disappointment. It's okay, mourn them, mourn that person. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Do not fall into the vampiric trap of all of this, of then losing all of all love yourself and basically turning into the thing that just attacked you. Don't fall into that trap. Acknowledge what they are, namely bad people. Beat their fucking asses. And she melting. Cannot look back. Remember Lot's wife. They were told, get out of Sodom. Get out. What, what was Sodom? A city filled with diabolical narcissists. S sodomites. Homosexual gang rapists. They were told, get out of here and don't look back. And she looked back wistfully, looking back into that paradigm of diabolical narcissism that she had just been delivered from. And it got her. She was turned to a pillar of salt. Don't look back, don't look back, 
don't look back. For, the, for our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power, against the rulers of the world of this darkness. This is what this scripture is talking about. This is the overarching dynamic of evil in the world. So I hope you guys have a better understanding of why uh, it seems that I inserted myself in the uh, narc empath war that was going on um, seemingly between Sweet Ma for Life and Tasha K. Um, it honestly is not about um, those two people. Um, this war is bigger than those people. It's bigger than myself. Uh, I was born for this. I was warned about this. And um, all is as it should be. My advice to you would be to listen to um, Anne Barnhart and uh, be like Lot's wife and do not look back because the only thing that you will see if you do decide to look back is the insanity that exists within the mind of the narcissist. Peace. That body, honey. Mm-hmm. Bitch what? Is she melting? I am the Oracle Oshun Ajay, Oshun Ajay, Oshun Ajay. That body, honey. Is she melting? <laughs> Can she dance for us, darling? <laughs> Tina, Tina thinks she's too dini. She's too dini. She's too dini. She thinks she's too dini. She thinks she's too dini. She thinks she's too dini. Dancing for us, darling. She's dancing. And she's dancing. And she's dancing. You better work it, darling. She's working it, honey. She's working it for the cameras. This bitch right here, and she want to dance up a damn storm. She gotta go, she gotta go, she gotta go. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all evil spirits who prowl throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Motherfucker! <laughs> I now literally don't have anything more to say. I'm back! My prayer is that this presentation helps one person one person not be spiritually destroyed by a diabolical narcissist and that one diabolical narcissist i have no idea who anywhere on earth if one diabolical narcissist 
is saved through prayer and joined as a result of someone watching this video, then everything, all of it, will have been worth it. Mm -hmm. Shazé Shanté, honey. You better work it, bitch. Love it, honey. 